Hi, and welcome to today's show. Well, this is a special year for Denny and I as we celebrate 20 years of our great getaway series. We thought what we'd do is take you back to the early days and show you some of the short clips of some of the places we've been to and the people we've met along the way. We'll be traveling to Ontario, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. These are great clips, great things that we've done along the way that were fun trips, and I know you'll enjoy them too. So let's get started. The clips we'll be showing you today are from our early days of great getaways. We're going to start in Bayfield, Wisconsin, where I'm going to learn to sail in a 36-foot sloop out on Lake Superior. We'll be around the Apostle Islands. It was a lot of fun out there. I learned a lot doing it, and we had a great time. I, I've been on a sailboat before, a little, I think it was an 18-footer, and uh, I know that they roll over in the water because I ended up in the drink. Okay. And uh, that's, that's, that's about it. That's about it. <laughs> is that considered experience? <laughs> Actually, that is, um, Tom, because a lot of people don't understand that when the wind comes across and hits the sail, something happens and the boat reacts. And you already know that, so you're one step ahead of the game. <laughs> okay. Well, that sounds good. Run away. In no time at all, Tom was behind the big wheel and pulling the sailboat away from the slip and out of the marina. Dawn had each person assigned a task, and the team worked to prepare the ship for full sail on the open water. As we quickly learned, everything on board required teamwork of some sort. The height of this concept was about to come as the mainsail would go up. Um, Tom, for hoisting the main, this, this halyard goes up over the top of the mast and uh, back down again, and we put it around the winch, and a winch works by the uh, friction between the line and the um, roughness on the winch. Okay. And so you'll be doing what's called tailing, and when you need be, Michelle will put the winch handle in and do the grinding. And you always want to look up at the sail to see what's happen happening with it, make sure nothing's um, caught and it's going up smoothly. Okay. So you go ahead, we're headed into the wind, the sail will left back, go ahead and, and start Twice hoisting. Start. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can do that as rapidly as you want. And that's, that's a delightful creature called an overwrap. Okay, I can see it was kind of sliding on me there. Uh -huh. so yeah, it looks great. Yep. Now we come to cable, and you can take some more wraps around. Oh, from here we crank, right, huh? here we crank. Now, do I keep pulling then? Exactly. Okay. okay now the sail rose, the wind covered its expanse, pulling the edges taut, and it began billowing majestically against the bright blue morning sky. The engine was off, the wind was up, and we were sailing. From Bayfield, Wisconsin, we're going to move up to Grand Marais, Minnesota, on Lake Superior's North Shore. It's a great little town noted for its artisans. While the landscape and panorama of Lake Superior and the harbors of Grand Marais appeal to people from all walks of life, there's a special draw here for artists. In fact, one of the favorite hiking destinations in the area is known as Artist Point. Well, if you're looking for just a, a nice pastime, especially when the weather's like this, where it's windy out, come on down along the shoreline, especially where the rocks are piled up. There's some great views down here. The huge waves coming in, crashing on the rocks, the spray flying up in the air. Beautiful spot to be dressed a little warmer. It does get a little chilly down here, but it's beautiful. A lot of people come just to see these waves crashing against the shore, especially in the month of November. You could spend the entire day just watching this. If you're not coming here to sketch or paint, at least make sure to remember your camera. The Lighthouse Hike is another lakeside walk that offers a beautiful view of the hills to the south and the blue water of Lake Superior and Grand Marais' signature lighthouse to the south. 
The original lighthouse was built in 1854, and it was lit by hand each day for many years until automation came on the scene. Yet the lake is only one side of the story. Grand Marais sits on the oldest exposed rock on Earth and is nestled against the backdrop of the Sawtooth Mountains. It's surrounded by millions of acres of lush forests graced with rocky cliffs, serene inland lakes, playful streams, and thundering waterfalls that empty into Lake Superior. Well, it's an up and down hike to get back here to the Devil's Kettle, but uh, along the way, you're gonna be lucky enough to see sites just like this one. It's just beautiful, high canyon walls. Nice sight, can't beat it. From here, we're going to move over to Gray County, Ontario, where we're going to see one of the most unique breweries that I've ever been to. A visit to the Neustadt Springs Brewery, built in 1859 by 40 stonemasons and designated as an Ontario Heritage Building in 1975, is a must. And if you call ahead, a tour of their famous caverns can be arranged. This is a great way to take in the old world ambiance of the village. Owner Val Stimson was on hand to give us a personalized tour of the labyrinth of tunnels and caves. At the moment we're uh, possibly brewing uh, 40 hectolitres a week, which is the equivalent of 11,000 beer bottles. So we're really very tiny. Um, it is open to the public. We do um, cabin tours, brewery tours, um, educational brewery tours at the weekends because obviously we are an operating brewery during the week. Uh, but people can come in and wander around because the way we've set it up, they can see what's going on, um, feel the history, read about the history, but can't touch any of the equipment or interfere with the actual running of the brewery. The caverns were truly amazing. It was hard to imagine that all of this was constructed without any mechanized equipment. Before we left, Val insisted that we try some of her beer potato sausage and spicy beer pepperettes. Of course, anything with beer in it tastes good to us. We were impressed with the rustic charm and friendly hospitality of this quaint little village tucked in rolling countryside. Almost everyone I know likes lighthouses, and we had the opportunity to go to Alpine in Michigan for a lighthouse festival some 20 years ago. While we were there, we met up with a good friend, Dan Hall, singer and songwriter, and one of his students. It was a great song, and we had a fun time. This is part of the uh, next generation of lighthouse keepers. We went to the schools and wrote songs with kids, and this is one of them. This is Carolyn Clemens, and she's a great little singer. I wrote this song with her and her classmates. Well, from Alpena, we're going to head across the state to the Leland Up Peninsula in a place they call Fishtown. As we moved to our next stop, we marveled at the awesome beauty of the area. We were about to take a step back in time. It was the small New England town of Leland located on the beautiful Atlantic Ocean. Well, maybe not, but when you looked around, you sure would think that that's where you were. This place called Fishtown, located on Lake Michigan in Leland, Michigan, is as picturesque as you'll find anywhere and must be seen to be appreciated. This commercial fishing district has provided a livelihood for residents of the town for over a century. Fishermen reach the fishing grounds of Lake Michigan by way of the Leland River, which is sometimes called the Carp River, using small sailboats until the introduction of the primitive gas-powered oak boats around 1900. 
Small fishing shanties and related buildings, such as ice and smokehouses, were constructed during the peak years of the industry, which spanned the first three decades of the 20th century. Now gray and weather beaten, some still serve their original purpose. Well, we're in Leland. It's also known as Fishtown. And that roar we're hearing in the background is the waterfall coming into Lake Michigan. And a very popular activity here in the fall is to come to the cove where we're seated and watch the salmon as they're jumping up the river. And one of the great experiences here at the cove is their escargot dish and uh, served along with some uh, great red wine from the peninsula. And it's nicknamed Fish Town because we have several fish shanties behind us, and a lot of these fish shanties have been converted into very unique shops. We have a cheese shanty here. We have a, can a shop that's just full of candy. We have another place that makes smoked whitefish sausage that is wonderful. There's uh, arts, there's crafts, there's t-shirts. There's a lot of very unique things uh, down here uh, in Leland at Fish Town. And there's a beautiful harbor that people boat from all over from Chicago. They boat over from Milwaukee. It's a lot of fun to come across the lake and, and spend the night here. As we take our trip back in time, one of the stops we made is at the Thunder Bay Resort. Now we've got elk in Michigan, but most people never see them. But this gives you a chance to see them up close and personal. One of the big draws here are the horse-drawn carriage rides through the elk preserve on the Thunder Bay Resort. The thing about that is uh, batting average has gone up to 100%. I think I can safely guarantee you that I'm gonna show you some elk tonight. The ladies will be pleased to know that uh, the new cabin here has all the modern conveniences and uh, you're no longer worried about being the first lady in line on the five degree below zero day with the outhouse because those seats were kind of chilly when you worked it that way. So um, I think it's been a, a pretty nice improvement in total. So this is the beginning of our 13th year and uh, uh, we think you're going to have a very good time this evening. We're going to do our darndest to make sure that you do. Uh, elk were native to Michigan when the early settlers arrived here. There were elk uh, pretty much at least throughout the Lower Peninsula. There were elk in Massachusetts when the, uh, the pilgrims hit Plymouth Rock. Uh, they pretty much covered most of North America and uh, they're quite large animals. The cows in the wild weigh five to seven hundred pounds, the bulls six to nine hundred pounds. Because of their size they don't have a great deal to fear from most predators and they're not quite as wary and elusive as white-tailed deer would be. They're a fairly curious animal. They're about as likely to sit there and stare at you as they are to run away. Well, for those early settlers who had uh, a family to feed on the frontier, or maybe they were responsible for food for a logging camp, uh, mighty tempting target, an awful lot of meat on the hoof, and uh, uh, pretty easy pickings. And that elk is standing there 50 yards away from you. He's not had any experience with muskets and gunpowder. Uh, wasn't even really a fair fight. So 1875, all of our elk in Michigan were gone. Um, that's a good 25, 30 years before we finished clear cutting these areas up north. So it was relatively early in our history. Most people know we almost wiped out all the buffalo or bison in North America. Most people don't realize we came very close to doing that with elk as well. It was Teddy Roosevelt setting up the national park system, Glacier, Yellowstone, those areas did provide a refuge for some of the animals that remain. And of course they've since done a pretty good job of repopulating the west from those areas. We're going to take it back in time right now. We're going to Iron County. One of our first trips over there, we went back to a Heron Rookery out in the middle of nowhere. It was like creeping up on Jurassic Park. He explained that there is a great blue Heron Rookery in the wilds of Iron County. There was just one problem. He wasn't exactly sure where it was. He had a fairly good notion of its location from descriptions friends had given him. And Eric had heard stories too. He assured us that we might be able to get close enough to capture some incredible video, things never before seen on our show. Still, we were here for an adventure, and this sounded too good to pass up. It had taken several miles and many false hopes, but the crew finally drove into a rough wooded area that looked promising. The trail was barely passable with ruts and water holes covering much of the surface. Gary and Eric agreed though, this was it. A short time later, we parked Gary's truck and struck out on foot. Initially, the hike through the woods was quite pleasant, but as we progressed, a combination of sensations began overtaking our group. We first noticed the ground getting mushier. Gary informed us that the beaver population was quite active in these parts and that the rookery itself was often in swamped. We'd be getting wetter if we continued. 
Next, the distant sound of the herons became noticeable, and not long after came, well, the smell. We turned to Gary for the explanation. The odor was heron droppings, he told us, and it is not for the faint-hearted. The herons utilize their excrement for a number of purposes, including nest building and self-defense. Like ancient soldiers pouring scalding liquids from the tops of castle walls, herons bombard ground-based and tree-climbing predators from the heights of their nests. With a rookery this large, that's a lot of bombing. By the time the trail brought us to the edge of the rookery, the sensations were incredible. Moving quietly so as not to spook these wary, sharp-eyed birds, we finally passed into full view of the rookery, and what a sight it was. Overhead, the huge birds circled and dove. Others glided, seemingly motionless against the clouds. Many guarded their nests, perched stately on the dead and decaying treetops which dominated the landscape. These trees have fallen victim to a twofold assault. The beaver dam's flooding has killed many, and the heron's acidic droppings have slowly destroyed others, eating away the bark and protective layers from the tops down. Herons will nest year after year in these same nests. Expert builders, the nests can usually withstand most natural elements, including the roughest storms. Most often, it is the continued rotting away of the snags and branches which bring them down. As Gary pointed out, it is ironic that the heron droppings, the very source of the protection of their homes, is the same source of their ultimate destruction. We counted at least 50 active nests while standing in one spot. There were herons in most of the nests, and the ones that looked empty held baby herons too young to fly. The adults would tolerate only so much of our watching them before they would pitch themselves off the nest and circle around trying to determine if we were friend or foe. Luckily, they seemed to realize we meant them no harm. Watching these large birds take flight and land left us spellbound, and we couldn't help but make comparisons with prehistoric birds. Indeed, flying with folded necks and extended legs, they bore an uncanny resemblance to the flying reptiles of the Mesozoic era. We felt as if we had stumbled into our very own Jurassic Park. On that note, we decided to leave the rookery and let these big birds get back to tending their young. It had been a long and tasking journey, but one extremely worthwhile. We would not soon forget this one-of-a-kind northern experience. This trip really takes us back in time. It was our first trip to Isle Royal out in the middle of Lake Superior. A lot of people don't get a chance to travel out here, but I think once you see it, you'll be making a trip out of it. Sometime early in this century, moose immigrated to Isle Royal, probably swimming from Canada's mainland. With an abundant food source and no predators, the moose population grew unhindered. During the cold winter of 1948 and 49, an ice bridge formed between Canada and the island, enabling a small pack of eastern timber wolves to cross over to Isle Royal. Since then, additional packs have become established as offshoots of the original pack. As if on cue, this cow and calf moose stepped out to the edge of the lake and went straight to the mineral lick. And before long, they had some company of their own. It's amazing to think that the only thing that separates these moose and the folks fishing on the other side is a few yards of water. According to Tom, Hidden Lake wasn't the only place moose were being spotted either. We were, uh, we were having breakfast uh, right in the lodge. Uh you know, having a wonderful cooked breakfast and a great place to eat, typical restaurant, but really nice. And right out the window, all of a sudden said, look at that. And, and here we have two moose walking down the pathway uh, right by the boat launch. And uh, a fox came walking along the shoreline with a good sized fish in his mouth and came within 25 yards of us until he decided it was time to go the other way. And I think he was just more concerned about the fish being taken than anything else. Don't for a minute think you can approach too close, though. They say there isn't anything more dangerous than a cow moose defending her calf. 
They are wild animals and therefore unpredictable. So don't let their docile manner fool you. Just enjoy them from a distance and let your telephoto lens bring them closer to you. We knew there'd be more opportunities for seeing moose here later in the day, so we continued our hike toward the top of Greenstone Ridge. The trail to the ridge top was as scenic as we could have hoped for. Dense stands of spruce bearded with moss lined the trail while boardwalks protected the swampy bogs where the trail crossed them. And then there were the smells, those pungent, spicy Northwoods fragrances that always beckon us to linger a while. Soon, the trail turned rocky, with large boulders strewn about, the trail winding around them. As we rounded this particular twist in the path, we came across this pinnacle of stone jutting vertically from the earth. According to our map, this was Monument Rock, which is actually an ancient stack left over from old lake levels and is still standing, weathering the forces of nature. When our final stop today, we're going to take you to the Douglas Houghton Falls in the Keweenaw Peninsula. This is Michigan's highest waterfall. We were out there years ago, our first trip out there, and uh, back then there weren't people, there weren't fences, there wasn't anything but cliffs. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Douglas Houghton Falls are one of the largest yet least known falls in the Upper Peninsula. Part of the reason may be the do-it-yourself atmosphere. Douglas Houghton Falls do not have the usual park-like accoutrements found in many of Michigan's roadside attractions. The trails are primitive, the fencing sparse at best, the informational plaques practically non-existent. But as you will see, this stop is worth the effort. After about a 10-minute walk down the trail from the parking area, visitors get their first glimpse of what's to come. These are the Upper Falls, a series of rapids and falls as the Hamill Creek gushes over its rocky bed. The upper section of the falls cascades only a few feet at its tallest point, but the river finds a greater showplace just down the stream. As the trail approaches the lower falls, the land around you begins to open and you're treated to increasingly better views of the distant countryside. From here, the view is tremendous but it gets even better. Let's join Tom and Keith Nimala further down the trail. This one is one of these that when you get over to the edge, your, your knees get weak. It's, uh, it uh, really gives you quite a thrill when you get over here. Yeah, we do caution people. It's very rough at the top. Uh, there are no fences, so please stay back. Uh, but there's a good view from quite a few advantage points around here. Now when you do come back here, you make the walk back, as Keith said, it's about a 10 minute walk back here. Kind of a rocky pathway as you come back. The creek is surprising because the stream that leads back here is only about 10 feet wide, and then all of a sudden it drops over a 100-foot cliff. And as you can see behind me, there's a lot, there's canyon walls back in here, and it's uh, supposedly now somewhere at the bottom is uh, one of the mine shafts or the opening to a mine, the Douglas Houghton Mine. And uh, we can't see it from here. We're not going to get close enough to try to see it, I don't think, because uh, it. It's just a little bit spooky. Yeah, it is, but there's, there's plenty of vantage points to see a lot of different angles here. And if you can imagine what this would look like in the spring. As we mentioned before, the Hamill Creek rushes over the upper falls, twisting and turning down a series of hills as it makes its way through the ever-expanding canyon. The river speeds along until the creek's turbulent contents blast away from the cliff in a dramatic freefall, 30, 40, 50 feet down into a sheer rock gorge. The canyon walls eventually catch the stream once again and create the final exclamation point to Douglas Houghton Falls' impressive show. Parallel cascades of glistening water clinging to the steep cliff, racing to the river far below. Douglas Houghton Falls encompass well over 100 feet from top to bottom, and every view along the ridge gives you something else to see. The trails offer even more scenic outlooks. For the most hardy, follow the paths all the way down to the river's edge at the bottom of the canyon. A 
I hope you enjoyed this 20 year celebration of great getaways here on PBS. We'd like to hear your thoughts too. You can get in touch with us at our website at greatgetaways.tv or make a comment on Facebook. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.